we kind of left off here last time. And we were talking about, um, if we let this load, we were talking about some acids and bases. Acids and bases. So here are some common acids and bases. Um, and we have these four, and we call these strong acids. Strong acids. And, um, and then we also have these things. If, oh, there we are. Uh, we have, just as we have strong acids, we have strong bases. And the strong acids are things like hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, perchloric acid, sulfuric acid. There are others. There are some other strong acids. Um, the, the halogens, uh, with the exception of fluorine, the halogens, when, uh, when they combine with a hydrogen ion, the halogens like to form strong acids. So uh, HBr, hydrobromic acid, uh, and HI, hydroiodic acid, are also strong acids. Um, and then HF um, isn't a strong acid. We'll talk about what that is and what that means in a moment. Strong bases are, are um, these things, sodium hydroxide. So most of the alkali metals and alkali earth metals will form strong bases. Strong. So what does, what does that mean, strong? Now it's tempting, it's tempting to kind of say that, you know, oh, well, like it's strong, so it must be highly reactive, or it must have, like a strong acid must have a really acidic pH. Uh, but that's not the case. That's, um, we don't be misled. Um, these, uh, these things, so uh, the pH, recall that the pH is a function of the concentration of H plus. The concentration of of the hydrogen ion in these solutions. And so um, you can have a very dilute strong acid that still has a relatively high pH. Now you, you can load up you know, your solution with these and the pH will be very, very low. Um, but it's possible, make, possible to make dilute solutions that are not particularly concentrated acids. So when we talk about the strength or weakness of an acid, just keep in mind that we're talking about something different than its concentration. Um, and we're, we're going to talk about both of those things today, the concentration of the acid and, um, and the strength. And just as we can have strong acids and bases, we can have weak acids and weak bases. And we're going to talk about what that means we're going to talk about it. So I'll just leave that off for now and say that these things are these things. Weak electrolytes, and we have our old friend, the ammonia reaction, where it steals a proton or steals H plus from water. And um, generally, generally, if we take an acid and a base and we put them together, um, oh no, my, I, we're, we get salt and water. I'm going to move that back up to where it was. And maybe I can move. Oh, no. I'm, I've locked my camera in place. So an acid and a base combine to, fall, to form salt and water in a special, um, special, kind of special instance of what we call a neutral, uh, a special instance of a double displacement reaction. Uh, that we call a neutralization reaction. So here's a couple of exa examples of acids and bases, uh, like orange juice and milk will combine, can combine to form just something that tastes bad and it curdles the milk. I, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, an evergreen shrub and concrete can combine to form a dead bush. Um, and uh, the soil under a pine tree um, can be combined with fertilizer to form like a white powder that forms because the fertilizer loses its solubility. Um, and what's happening is it actually becomes this salt that 
sticks to the soil. And here's a, an example of an acid, hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, and they combine um, in, if we recall the rules of our double replacement reactions, they combine to form sodium chloride and water. And if we think about what the net ionic equation is doing um, for that reaction, I'm just going to hide my cat camera because my cat's not in the frame right now. And maybe I can move. Oops. So if we think about, there we go. If we think about the net ionic equation, what we're actually talking about is this hydronium ion and this hydroxide ion, and they recombine to form water, a couple molecules of water. We can also talk about the H plus ion, um, just the H plus, and it jumps over and combines with hydroxide ion to form water. Um, so this is the this special instance of this double replacement reaction, or just the, uh, the net ionic reaction for an acid-base neutralization, where hydronium ion is the acid and the hydroxide ion is the base, and they react to form water. And there are these arrows, and one points toward the products and the other points toward the reactants, but the one that's pointing toward the products is a lot, much bigger. It's much bigger. And uh, which means that the product side is favored. So we're more likely to have product than we are to have the, the back reaction or the reverse reaction and form these hydronium and hydroxide ions. So uh, here are some common acids. Uh, we have sulfuric acid, H2SO4, uh, which forms, uh, we, we, we use it in lead acid batteries that we put in automobiles, um, just the, the gasoline type of automobile. Um, uh, it's not the electric kind. Uh, these batteries are way too, way too heavy for, to put in electric, uh, electric vehicles, um, but they're cheap. So uh, we put them in, in gas, gasoline-powered cars. There's nitric acid, HNO3, which is used to make fertilizers and explosives. Uh, we have phosphoric acid, which is a food flavoring. And um, phosphoric acid is kind of the only reason that we're able to drink Coca-Cola without it being kind of disgustingly sweet. Um, it's added uh, to what's basically a sugar solution with extra caramel flavor coloring um, that, you know, like the amount of sugar in Coca-Cola is is way more than most people would find to be uh, like acceptable to drink, except that they load it up with phosphoric acid. And that makes, uh, makes it tangy as well as sweet. And so, um, we're able to drink it. Um, once we drink it, it goes into our stomach where uh, we have stomach acid, which is hydrochloric acid. Um, acetic acid is our old friend vinegar. Um, at least vinegar is a dilute form of acetic acid. There, uh, if, we, if we don't have any water around, um, as we might recall from, there was an example problem a couple of weeks ago uh, that dealt with a, a mass of acetic acid that's pure acetic acid and that stuff is flammable because what we have right here is this carbon-carbon bond and if there's no water around to stop the reaction this will burn uh, if you set it on fire. If you set it on fire it'll burn. And then finally we have carbonic acid which is what we uh, put in to water uh, when we dissolve CO2 in water to make carbonated water. Like, I have some sparkling water right here. It's vaguely grapefruit flavored. It's the Costco version of La Croix. Um, but uh, carbonated water, um, you know, is, is kind of tasty and fun. Um, unless, of course, that carbonated water happens to be the result of us 
increasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and then dissolving extra CO2 into all of our lakes, streams, rivers, uh, oceans, seas, canals, um, and other bodies of water. Bays, I guess, ponds, um, a puddle, I don't know. Anyway, um, when we do that, uh, it ends up being, you know, kind of a problem because there's all this stuff that lives in those bodies of water that uses the solubility of things like calcium carbonate in order to precipitate their shells and exoskeletons and their skeletons. And they can't do that if the acidity is too high or if there's too much carbonic acid in the system. Um, and that's, uh, as I've said, kind of a big problem. And it's actually a much greater risk than you might think. Like the sensitivity of these systems to increased acidity is uh, fairly high. Here are some names of some common acids. This should all be pretty familiar to you from the unit uh, last semester on nomenclature. So this is kind of just a reminder that all of these things have names that refer to their structures and refer to their uh, formal oxidation states. So uh, the hypochlorous is like hypochlorite, anyway, and so on. Here's a little animation of how hydronium ions form. We have the hydrogen ion, which um, if you think about it, uh, what you get, if you pull the, the electron away from a hydrogen atom, you're left with just the nucleus because hydrogen only has one electron. And, and the nucleus of the hydrogen atom is just a proton for, for most hydrogen uh, atoms, that is. And so uh, we're left with just this proton, this little charged particle, and we can kind of stick that to uh, some water, if my, I don't think, oh, it was going. And then it jumped forward and, and uh, that sticks onto this, this water molecule and it becomes this charged water molecule, H3O+, plus, which is the hydronium ion. Here's some information about sulfuric acid, H2SO4. Um, it's the most commonly produced industrial chemical in the world. Um, it has all these uses. We can actually use uh, sulfuric acid consumption as a kind of a proxy for economic or industrial uh, development or industrialization um, because more developed countries use more of it. And yeah, anyway, um, as we mentioned, it's used in automobile batteries, and it's also called oil of vitriol because uh, oil, because it's uh, when it's in its concentrated form, it kind of sticks to itself and it gives it kind of a viscous characteristic. So it flows more like oil than it, than, uh, it does, than it, flow, than it would flow like water. And then vitriol because, I don't know, it smells angry or something. Um, sulfur compounds tend to have a very characteristic odor, to kind of put it gently. They smell, um, all right, story time. So, so when I was young, I was in this class, and, um, and one day my friend Carl got a nosebleed, and the teacher in the class was like, oh, like, neat, like, let's, let's get a slide and, you know, try to get some of the blood, and we can look at it under the microscope. And uh, someone in the class was like, ew, gross. And then uh, the teacher was like, oh, hang on. No, like, let's, 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 let's be clear here. In this class, we're trying to be scientists. And, and to a scientist, a scientist is not like a normal person. A scientist, whenever a normal person sees, okay, whenever a scientist sees something that a normal person would say is gross or disgusting, what the scientist does is the scientist leans back in his chair. So lean back in your chairs, right? And you have us all lean back in our chairs. And he's like, and he, he rubs his beard, so rub your beards, and and we're all like, um, like we're 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 seven, and and the girls in the class were like, we're girls, like none of us have beards, and he's like, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, rub your beards. And we're like, all right, so we're rubbing our beards, 
And he's like, good. And then the scientist says, very interesting. So say that, very interesting. We're like, oh, very interesting. It's like, good, good. Now, and now we're able to look at this thing objectively and be scientists about it. Um, so anyway, so with that in mind, sulfur compounds smell very interesting. On to nitric acid, which stains proteins yellow. So if you get it on your skin, it'll turn your skin yellow. Um, you can use it to make explosives and fertilizers and rubber, plastic dyes, pharmaceuticals. It's also called aqua fortis, the very strong water. And um, you can, uh, fun fact, you can take concentrated nitric acid, mix it with concentrated sulfuric acid, and form something called aqua regia, which is the royal water. And uh, aqua, this combination of sulfuric acid and nitric acid is one of the only things that will dissolve gold. And um, at, like during the like, kind of roll up to World War II, uh, when the Nazis were invading everyone, there were two scientists who'd won Nobel Prizes, and they were living in Copenhagen. And um, they were both at the same university, and uh, the, the Nazis were invading, and the Nazis had this habit of stealing gold from everybody and taking everyone's gold. And these two scientists, they had their Nobel Prize medallions, and the Nobel Prize Committee makes these medallions out of gold, or at least they did. And there's still gold, but they're, anyway. Um, so, it's, so they had these medallions of gold, and they're like, well, we have to flee. Um, we can't take our Nobel Prizes with us because they'll be confiscated by the Nazis at the border. We can't leave them in the lab because the Nazis will come through and they'll find them and they'll take them and then we won't have our prizes anymore. What's to be done? So what they did is they took some sulfuric acid and some nitric acid, they mixed up a quick batch of aqua regia and plop plop fizz fizz, oh what a relief it is, and they dissolved their Nobel Prize medallions. It worked fantastically. Their solution turned its characteristic bright orange color. They took their jar of Nobel Prizes and they stashed it on a shelf up in the lab that they left in somewhat dis like, you know, kind of messy, so that it just kind of like looks like just another jar of who knows. Like maybe the Nazis saw it, thought it was iron brew. Um, so they, they flee and uh, they go to, I think, maybe Sweden or Norway, another, a, a neutral country. Norway ended up getting invaded by the Nazis as well. Um, but eventually the war ends and the two scientists return to their lab. They find that the Nazis had in fact ransacked their labs for anything of value, but didn't really find much. And among the things they didn't find were the two Nobel Prize medallions that were still sitting in solution on the shelf. The scientists precipitated the gold out, cleaned it up, and sent it off to the Nobel Prize Committee saying, we're very sorry, but we seem to have uh, found ourselves to be in the need of new medallions. The Prize Committee recast the medallions and gave them uh, back to the two scientists. Which is to say, the next time that you're running from the Nazis, and need to hide your gold Nobel Prize medallion, just mix up a quick batch of aqua regia and you'll be good to go. Hydrochloric acid is used by the stomach to process food. Um, it helps activate uh, the, the enzyme trypsin, which uh, goes on to uh, activate another enzyme, and the two enzymes then combine their power is to digest proteins. Uh, you can buy this stuff, hydrochloric acid, a dilute solution. It's called muriatic acid and you can get it at, you know, like your local Ace Hardware. Um, it's used to adjust the pH in swimming pools and also to clean um, masonry or stone, like, um, like brick walls or concrete floors. Um, it'll etch concrete so if the concrete floor is stained with oil or whatever, like you have a garage or a carport and it has oil stains on it, you can clean it up with hydrochloric acid. Common bases. All right. First on the list, sodium hydroxide, 
our old friend. We just used it to make soap. Um, it's formula sodium NaOH, sodium hydroxide. Its common name is lye, with a Y, L-Y-E, or caustic soda. Caustic because it's basic, and soda because it's a sodium compound. Uh, next on the list is potassium hydroxide, KOH. Uh, the common name for that is lye. Great. Nice one. Thanks, English, for your remarkable specificity in naming things. Very good job. You, great. All right. Um, or caustic potash, uh, because again, basic, and this time it's a potassium compound. Uh, we also have magnesium hydroxide, which is, uh, it's kind of a milky, it's kind of like white-ish um, solution. Um, and we call that milk of magnesia, milk because it's kind of milky, and magnesia because it's a magnesium compound. We use this all the time to um, make antacid, uh, like liquid antacids, because this will neutralize stomach acid um, without making you sick. So if you were to drink, say, a solution of calcium hydroxide, you'd get very sick. Uh, likewise with sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, you'd get really sick if you had, if you, and you'd burn your throat, like they're caustic, not fun. Um, and calcium hydroxide can be used to adjust the, uh, the pH of soil. Um, in the case, so suppose you have like a bunch of evergreens and they've been busy acidifying the soil and you would rather grow maybe some grass underneath them instead of the moss that's growing and so you would put down some calcium hydroxide, some slaked lime. Um, this is also used um, in, in Alaska. Uh, there's a tendency to build houses without running water. And the toilet facilities at these houses is, uh, it's, well, it's an outhouse. It's a pit in the ground with a little shed over it. And you, you know, do your business in there. And then over the course of a winter, it kind of starts to end up, you kind of fill it up with human waste. Um, and so what, what you do is then you take a bag of slaked lime and you dump it in the pit. And that helps to break things down, uh, liquefy things, break down the paper, um, and uh, kind of neutralize some of the smells, which I think is very interesting. All right, and next on the list is our old friend ammonia water, which is household ammonia, which is a glass cleaner. Here's our hydroxide ion. Yay, it's OH minus. And here's, oh, here's the, what happens with the, uh, the household ammonia, NH4OH, will steal a, a proton away from water to form ammonium hydroxide. Same slide over again. There we go. So, all of these acids have various strengths. So what does that mean, strength? Well, in a previous class, I, I mentioned something about how different elements have different affinities for electrons. So some, some elements really love electrons. They, they want to grab hold of all, all the electrons that they can manage to grab hold of. And other elements, they're just kind of like, eh, whatever, right? Hydrogen is more on the eh, whatever side. And some of these elements are more on the, like, super greedy of electrons side. So up at the top of this list, we have hydrogen combined with two, a whole bunch of two of those elements, chlorine and oxygen. Both chlorine and oxygen have very high uh, electronegativities. So electronegativity is a scale that was developed by this guy Linus Pauling. Um, and basically, it just describes an element's affinity for electrons. And um, so chlorine and oxygen will try to grab all the, like, pull all the electrons in this molecule 
over toward that the, the chlorine and oxygen side of the molecule. And then that leaves the hydrogen with like not much not not much electron like density to kind of create an interatomic bond. So the hydrogen there can just kind of fall off at the slightest provocation. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about strength of an acid, is its tendency to have the hydrogen fall off. So the strength of an acid is how strongly it ditches its proton. It, ditches, it gets rid of its H+. It donates its H+. So up at the top, these are very, very strong acids. They will donate H+, at pretty much any concentration. It doesn't matter how much H+, is already around. They're just like, here's, here's more H+. Here's more H+. Um, and as we move further and further down the list, it becomes more and more difficult uh, to release that H plus from the molecule. Just as we have strength of acids, we have strength of bases. And here we have the conjugate bases of each of these acids. So the conjugate base, recall, forms from the acid of a thing. And, um, and just as, so like with decreasing acid strength going from top to bottom, here we'll have decreasing base strength going from the bottom to the top because it's like inversely proportional, right? So if a thing is a very strong acid, its conjugate base is very unlikely to, it takes a lot uh, to get that conjugate base to accept that acidic proton back onto itself. And um, so with that, I'm going to hide that. Yes. And then I'm going to switch to there. Okay. With that, we'll move on to this bit. So remember, I gotta turn on my tablet. There we go. So pH and concentration, we covered covering strong acids and bases, equilibrium and molarity again. And um, uh, homework we mentioned. So um, remember how we have this, you know, like HA for our generic acid generic acid. Uh, if we take H, A, and B, and that kind of, we can have this thing in equilibrium that goes to A minus, because the acid's going to donate H plus, and we're going to have H, B, Plus. Um, any guesses what B stands for? This here. Base. Yes. Base. B is for base. Actually, it is B for base in this case. This is A and B, right? It could be anything and anything else. But in this case, it's generic base. This thing in the middle is our equilibrium arrow, and we've kind of talked about this a little bit. We've kind of talked about it, but not really. Equilibrium arrow. We kind of talked about this when we were talking about the auto-ionization of water and how water is like low-key ionic, and that lets us do things like single uh, replacement ion exchange reactions with it. Um, but this equilibrium arrow is something that we're going to talk a little bit more about today. Finally, finally. And this here is what forms from our acid, so this is going to be our conjugate base.
This is the conjugate base of H A, which makes this here our conjugate acid of B, conjugate acid of our generic base B. And I'm gonna I'm gonna color code these to make them more obviously the thing. And that's green and I know that it's not necessarily color blindness friendly, but I'm gonna be careful to use um, another color that's not red. So this is blue, light blue, and this is also going to be light blue. So the generic acid and the generic base form the conjugate base of the acid and the conjugate acid of the base. The colors go together. And that equilibrium arrow is part of the new thing that we're going to talk about today, even though we're, we're just going to talk about it. Like, we're just going to talk about it, and we're not even going to, it's not even part of the assignment or anything. It's just a thing that we're talking about so that we can explain what's going on with these strong acids and bases. So that, that equilibrium arrow refers to a system in equilibrium. So equilibrium happens. What just happened there? Equilibrium. Um, happens when a reaction reaches steady state. Reaches steady state. which means the forward reaction actually let me let me put this another way equilibrium happens when the forward reaction and the reverse reaction reach a steady state So the forward reaction goes from HA and B to A minus and HB plus. And the forward reaction and the reverse reaction the reverse reaction goes from A minus and HB plus to HA and B plus or H, A, and B. So equilibrium happens when the forward reaction and the reverse reaction reach steady state. So they kind of balance, right? It's like, they're like equal. Once that happens, we can compare the product side with, uh, with the reactant side. How do we do that? We can compare products by dividing it by the reactants, products over reactants. We can compare the ratio, the ratio here, of our products with our reactants. So this, this whole thing here, I'm going to highlight this in yellow because it's kind of, this is kind of a cool thing. 
And this is all, this is like as far as we're going to go with this. This whole thing here, where is my purple pen that I've been using? It's right there. This whole thing, this is called the equilibrium constant. or k for constant, eq, where eq is kind of subscript, right? keq, also called, um, it's also called the equilibrium coefficient. And pretty much every reaction has one of these. And we can treat um, the dissolution or the dissociation of an acid as though it's a reaction. When we do that, we have a special kind of equilibrium constant for that called the acidity constant. So if we look at just the dissociation of our acid into H plus and A minus, when we go to compare the concentration of H plus times the concentration of A minus, we compare that with the concentration of remaining protonated acid, the original acid form of that uh, conjugate base there, what we get is something called the acidity constant which is K sub A in the subscript. So this is the acidity constant, which is just the equilibrium constant for an acid. Look how similar, look, look, look how similar, look how similar, look. They're the same thing. Same, same. So, if an acid dissociates really, 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 really fully and completely, HA is going to be tiny. Like the amount of HA, the amount that's still protonated in the uh, dissociate in the solution once it reaches steady state, the amount of HA is going to be very, very tiny. And the amounts of these is going to be relatively large. So what happens when you divide a relatively large number by a relatively super, super tiny number? Like, the result is a super huge number, right? So if you divide, like, um, you know, 10 to the 14th by like 10 to the minus, twenty, like you divide it by a super tiny number, then you end up with a super huge number, right? And what that means is um, strong acids have a large acidity constant. Weak acids not so much. Weak acids not so much. So how do we get uh, that, uh, so, like, suppose we, suppose we have a weak acid and it's just, like, we, we have this, the, a certain amount that's still, like, 
we we have this proton still stuck to the molecule and we want to get it off somehow we want it we want it to dissociate as completely as possible so that we have a, we get as much of this a minus as possible what can we do well along comes this guy with this principle i'm not going to put that in orange it's not something that we're actually doing there was this guy le chatelier and he had this principle le chatelier's principle And Le Chatelier's principle says that uh, we can move a reaction, we can push a reaction toward product formation, we can push a, a reaction Rxm is reaction, we can push a reaction toward formation of product by removing product or adding reactant. So, if we have a weak acid and it's not, and we, we want to get rid of more of our HA, we can just remove our H plus. We can, if we remove our H plus, to get to the point where the concentration of A minus times the concentration of H plus that we have still gives us the same acidity constant, then we can get more dissociation of our HA. Again, we're not going to talk about weak acids so much this semester. Um, we're just going to mention it, and then we're going to deal with everything as though it's a strong acid and it dissociates completely. Le Chatelier's principle is really important. It's so important that it has its own oh, its own standard in the ne uh, next generation science standards. Um, but this is kind of like, this is the only thing that we have planned with it right now is just mentioning it and moving on. Here's this thing, just keep this in mind. We can push a reaction toward formation of product by removing product or by adding reactant. by removing product or by adding reactant. So uh, remember with the, um, the silver nitrate uh, precipitation, where like the thing, it kind of like grew on the surface of the copper and then like if you shake it off, then it starts growing again really fast. That's what's going on there. Like you, you product forms until it can't get to the reactant, and then you remove the product, and then you can, yeah, all right. Anyway, ta-da. With that in mind, let's go into our, how much time do we have? We have about 20 minutes. That's just enough time to get through uh, some guided practice. So let's look at this here, number three. Copy and paste. Let 
larger font size. Okay. There's a couple of issues that I have with, with the way this is worded. I should have changed it, but oh well. What is the molarity of a solution made by dissolving 1.90 grams of HCl in 642 ml of water? So what is molarity anyway? Anyone? Molarity. Do you remember? It's been a couple of weeks. It's been a couple of weeks, but we did mention this. Molarity, this thing here, is the number of moles in a liter of solution, moles per liter of solution. So that's, those are the units that we're going to be solving to. We're going to be solving to some number of, we're going to be looking for moles of, actually moles of HCl per liter of solution. And, um, and then what are we starting with? We're dissolving 1.90 grams of HCl in 642 ml water. So 1.90 grams HCl and 642 ml. M is going to be lowercase m. All right, and we need to get to moles of HCl per liter. We have grams of HCl per milliliter. So how are we going to get there? Well, to start us off, let's change those milliliters into liters. So we want liters in the denominator. So we'll put our conversion ratio on the top for every thousand milliliters, every 1,000 milliliters. I'm trying to write and say things at the same time. Every thousand milliliters we have one liter. One liter for every thousand milliliters. Milliliters will cancel and now we have grams of HCl over liters. Next we have to change that gram, those grams of hydrogen chloride into moles of HCl. So for every mole of HCl, we have, uh, let's see, so hydrogen has an atomic mass of 1.008. Chlorine has a, an atomic mass, and that's grams per mole. Grams per mole. Chlorine has an atomic mass of 35. 0.453 grams per mole, which gives us a molecular weight of 36.461 grams per mole for HCl. So for every mole of HCl, we'll have 36 0.461 grams of HCl. We're going to cancel those grams of HCl with the thing over there on the top. Rewrite everything so that it's closer together. I'm just going to highlight that, highlight that, and drag it over. There we go. And now we have a thing we can just start plugging numbers into a calculator and it'll spit out a number for us. All right. Take everything, start with 1.90, uh, divide by everything on the bottom, multiply by everything on the top, and we should be good to go. So divided by 642, multiply by 1,000, divide by 36 point. Four six one, and I get this number zero point zero eight one one six. I've lost my 
pen. 0 0.08116. We have three significant figures here. So we'll round to the third significant figure and get 0 0.0812 moles HCl per liter. Next up, so there's our concentration. What is the hydronium ion concentration of this solution? So the hydronium ion is H3O plus. But I'm going to treat it as though it's H plus because it's way easier to write a dissociation equation or dissociation expression for HCl if we ignore the fact that there's water around. So um, actually we can do this. So we have H C L and H two O and then we end up with H3O plus and Cl minus. So, um, what this is saying is for every mole of HCl and mole of water, we get a mole of the hydronium ion and a mole of the Cl minus. So what's the hydronium ion concentration of the solution? We, we want to know, we want to know concentration, so moles per liter, so we want to know how many moles of H3O plus per liter in the solution that we just, that we just made. Um, so we know that we have 0.08 one, two moles of HCl per liter of solution. And we want to know how many, how many moles of H3O plus. So uh, for every mole of HCl, we have one mole of H3O plus. and moles of HCl will cancel, and we're left with moles of H3O plus as our moles of H3O plus per liter as our unit. And then we, we don't even have to plug anything into a calculator. We can just copy that number over. And I know what you're thinking. At least I know what I would be thinking, which is, why on earth did we do all of this just to get the same number that we had just before? Why, why do we even bother? Why did we do that? Why did we do that? And the answer is that it's, I mean, it's convenient that we got the same number this time, but it doesn't always work like that. It doesn't always work like that. Um, if, we, uh, if we scroll down here a little way, uh, like, look here, look, here's, here's something that has two hydrogens, two hydrogens, and scroll down all the ways here, determine the, the concentration of OH minus when this little tiny amount of barium hydroxide is just, and here we have two hydroxides, so we want to know the hydroxide ion, so we need, we need this step, we need it here, we need to do this step, we need to do this step, so we'll do it now so that we remember later on to do it when it's important. We need this step. We need it. Eight. All right. Finally, what's the pH of the solution? So I just want to remind everyone that the pH, we covered this in the last class, pH is equal to the opposite um, of the power of 10 that we need in order to get the concentration of H plus. 
And that's pretty much what we have here, like the hydronium ion and the concentration of H+. And they're not quite the same, but I use them interchangeably. Um, so our pH is going to be the antilog, as we sometimes call it, of this 0 0.0812. Um, moles of H3O mole H plus per liter. pH is its own unit though, so we don't really need to include any other unit. And this is something we can plug into our calculator. I hit the negative button that's down in the parentheses at the bottom of the keypad. Um, and then the, I have a natural log and base 10 log button that I have to hit twice in order to get to the base 10 log. And then I just punch in that number, 0 0.0812, and it comes back to tell me that our pH is 1.090. 1.090, but we only have three significant digits, so we'll round it off there pH is 1.09. Oh, this little tiny amount, little tiny, well, it's actually kind of a lot, 1.9 grams in kind of a small amount, anyway. So that's our pH, that's our pH. How much time? We have about 10 minutes left. And I'm gonna squeeze some more space in here. And we can do another one of these as guided practice. Let's do the one we just looked at with the barium hydroxide. There it is. Draw a line. Are there any questions so far? Any questions? Any questions? Hearing none, let's keep going. Determine the concentration of OH minus when 0 0.009 grams of barium hydroxide is dissolved in 3.55 liters of water. So we're looking for a number of moles of OH minus per liter. We're starting with a mass 0 0.009 grams BA OH2 in 3.55 liters of water. The water is not really important to this whole thing. Because what we're talking about actually is liters of solution. All right. Looks as though we're going to have to convert from mass to moles, and then we're going to have to convert from moles of barium hydroxide to moles of OH minus. So when we have BA, OH2 
that will dissociate into Ba2 plus and 2 OH minus. Ba2 plus and 2 OH minus. So first, let's uh, let's um, yeah. Let me move this down just a bit. All right, and then I'm going to just rewrite this over here. So we want moles OH minus per liter. So we're going to have to convert to moles of barium hydroxide and then to moles of OH minus. So first, let's convert to moles of barium hydroxide. So barium has a molar mass, or an atomic mass, of 137.328 grams per mole. We're going to have two oxygens, which uh, will have an atomic mass of 31.998 grams per mole, and we're also going to have two hydrogens, which will give us 2.016 grams per mole. We'll add these up. 8 plus 8 plus 6 is 22. Down to 2, carry the 2. 2 plus 2 plus 9 plus 1 is 14. Down the 1, or 4, carry the 1. And uh, let's see, 1 plus 9 is 10, plus 3 is 14 again. Sorry, 13 this time. 13, down to 3, carry the 1. And here we have 11, carry the 1, 7, and 1. So 100. 71.342 grams for every mole of barium hydroxide. So for every mole of barium hydroxide, we have 171.342 grams of barium hydroxide. grams of barium hydroxide will cancel. So now we have moles of barium hydroxide per liter. And now we can look at our ratio here. And we see that for every mole of barium hydroxide that we put into solution, we get two moles of OH minus. All right. So for every, and we're trying to get moles of barium hydroxide to cancel for every mole of BaOH2, we get two moles of OH minus. Moles of barium hydroxide will cancel, and we should be left with a number <clears throat> that we can plug into a calculator. We have zero point. 009 divided by everything on the bottom, multiplied by everything on the top, divided by 3.55, divided by 171.342, multiplied by 2, which gives us 0. Point, then four zeros, 29592. Here's a question, where do I round that off? How many significant digits do I have? How many significant digits are in this problem?
So the two here is tempting, um, but this is a ratio. This is a ratio. So this, this doesn't count, so to speak. This wasn't a measurement. This was like a theoretical ratio. So we have two different measurements. We have 0 0.009 and 3.55. So how many significant digits do we have? I might be wrong, but I think we have one. Is that right? Is that right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we have only one. I think we have only one significant digit. So we're going to round this off, right? Because we can, we can express this as like 9 times 10 to the 3, right? And that would only have one significant digit. Um, so we're going to round this off to 2, uh, or sorry, it's 2, 9, 5. So we're going to round this off to 3 times 10 to the minus 5. Moles of OH minus per liter. What is the pH and what is the concentration of H plus? I'm going to check the time real fast. We are over time. I'm sorry, um, but I want to get through this last bit. What is what is which of these should we solve first? Concentration of H plus or pH? I've heard H plus, but it would be a lot easier to find the pH because. We know that pH plus pOH will equal 14. We have a concentration of OH minus, and the pOH is equal to the opposite power of 10 that we need to get this concentration of OH minus. So, it's the opposite power of 10 that we need to get 3 times 10 to the minus 5. And that's something I can plug into my calculator. Negative log 0 0.000 zero, three, and I get 4.52287, which is, should I round this off? I think I should. So 4.5, which actually rounds up to five, because we only have one significant digit. pH plus 5 equals 14, pH equals 9. So what's the concentration of H plus? Remember that the, like, 9 is the opposite power of 10 that we need to get the concentration of H plus. So 10 to the minus 9 is the concentration of H plus. <laughs> Ta-da! That's it. That's all the time we have for today. This this was this was like four point. Five two two, which rounds up to five. All right, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, let me know if you have any questions, and uh, we'll see you on.